What's going on, everybody? Mike O back with another episode of Hobby Talk. Been a while, took a little hiatus there, but I'm really excited to be back talking about the world of sports card collecting. And joining me today will be Caesar Carbajal, also known on YouTube as Pepino Man. Caesar, welcome to the podcast today. Hey, thanks. Hi, everybody. This is Caesar joining Michael. I'm pretty excited to do this. I've been waiting a long time. It's been a long time since the last one. What, since the Super Bowl? Yeah. What was your last one, right about? Yeah, the last one was recorded right after the Super Bowl, and I know we've been discussing doing this for months, and uh, we finally got around to doing it, so I'm really excited to uh, talk a little bit about what you do on YouTube, what you've done with the sport of baseball, what got you into collecting, and what you collect. So we have a lot to get to, so we're going to you know, try and jump right into it. But uh, Caesar, you, uh, you're well known on the YouTube in the YouTube community, I should say. Uh, a lot of people enjoy your content. You're an entertainer on there, for sure. Uh, people have a blast watching your videos, but it's not all just about the entertainment. You're also a serious card collector. You know your sports cards, specifically your baseball cards. So just uh, just real quick, why don't you uh, tell everyone out there kind of how you got into uh, making YouTube videos? Uh, the way I got into making YouTube videos was uh, I started watching uh, other YouTube, uh, you know, channels and watching all the videos. And I wanted to make one for the longest time, but I didn't know how. So I just watched videos for quite a while. And it wasn't until actually Nate tops 8501 because um, I started asking a bunch of other tubers that were, you know, big time when I first started watching. And they all started were telling me that I needed a computer, I needed a iPad, you know, I needed this, I needed that. So I said, okay, I'm going to ask for a computer for Christmas so I can start making YouTube videos. But then I, I um, messaged Nate on Facebook and he told me, oh, I should use my phone. You could use your phone. And then voila, I used my phone and I, I first video that I loaded up was actually a video that I filmed at Dodger Stadium on one of the playoffs and it was a real short video it was just kind of like a test to see if it worked and it uploaded you know and I probably got like 16 10 views <laughs> but that was the start of my YouTube video making days and I want to discuss real quick just because you know a lot of this audience is from the YouTube community this gets broadcast on YouTube so a lot of people listen there but we also have people listening out on iTunes and SoundCloud and other podcast websites so you know I just want to talk a little bit about the YouTube community itself before we get even more into your channel you know what would make one want to make videos on YouTube and what would make a sports card collector want to watch YouTube videos uh well as far as me making YouTube videos, um, it's actually something I've been doing for a very long time. And when I say a long time, I mean, I was making videos on Instagram. Um, you know, I don't know why I just started making comedic videos. But I can remember um, when I was younger, you know, 14, 15 years old, this kid, Billy, he had a, a video recorder that actually worked with a tape player, like a tape, you know, an actual tape. Old and they were recording. Yeah. And they were recording black and white. But, I mean, you would take, like, a 60-minute tape, and it would only record, like, maybe eight minutes. And I used to make music videos on my own with those with that camera. Um, you know, I would, you know, there was a rapper named Too Short, and I would, you know, cut off some shorts and tape some shoes to my knees and just do a, a dance video to his video, you know. And I, and I was showing the people, and people would love them, and, hey, do another one, do another one. So... Making videos is something I've been doing since I was a teenager. Um, you know, I guess I loved the attention back then and, you know, and entertaining people. And so now it's evolved to this thing on YouTube with baseball cards. I mean, so I'm basically combining two things that I've been doing my whole life. And in terms of the community, um, like what value for a sports card collector do you think there is? Because for me, Obviously, you can be entertained, and you have a very entertaining channel, if not the most entertaining, but um, the knowledge. I mean, how much do you learn on YouTube about this hobby in general? Oh, I've learned 
a lot. If it wasn't for most of the YouTube channels, um, I would be clueless as to what's going on these days. When I first got back into the hobby and I was on Instagram and I was too embarrassed to ask people, you know, what does TTM mean? What does, you know, short print mean? What is a parallel? I had no idea what those were because I'm an old school collector and I collected mostly in the 80s and very early 90s. And I took a hiatus from collecting like a lot of people my age did, actually. And so I didn't collect at all during the 90s, you know, and I got back into it in the early 2000s. So I had no idea about inserts, you know, and short prints. I had no idea what they were. So people always, you know, you see people, it's an SP, it's a parallel. And I was always too embarrassed to ask. So I just never asked. And it wasn't until I saw... You know, if I, I got to do a name drop on this one, it be Baseball Card Junkies TV. And they were dedicated to teaching people about 90s inserts and stuff like that. And that's if it wasn't for watching that, um, I would have no clue as to what's going on in baseball card collecting today because I'm old school. I just like to collect, you know, the basics. But, you know, I didn't like to shine. And now I love that shine. Shine. You know? The refractors are amazing. And like you, I, I kind of like all cards. I, I love the vintage stuff. I, I haven't really gotten into the pre-war stuff, but of course I would love to. You know, I, I love having a diverse collection. I, I really enjoy all of it. And that's what I love about uh, this community on YouTube is the fact that you can gain knowledge. You learn so much. You can learn about uh, different brands of cards, new stuff, old stuff, things that came out, players, and it can it can kind of um, help direct your collection a little bit. You might, you know, even go back like you were talking a lot about uh, the refractors and even the '90s stuff. And there's been I don't know how to describe it, but there's been a resurgence of the '90s inserts. A lot of people getting into them, and it's nostalgic for a lot of people. And that's about the time I was collecting as well. So then I start looking at it, and going, "Oh man, I used to have this and that, and I'd like to pick up that." And you can kind of learn about it all. And there's just such a diversity in the collectors on YouTube, and I think that's one of the great things. There's set collectors, there's autograph collectors, there's people who slab cards, raw cards, vintage, new stuff. And, you know, I just, I think it's an excellent community. And I must say that you certainly have been an asset to that community for sure. Oh, uh, well, I just do what I do. And with everybody else doing what they do, you know, it's a great collaboration in the community where, um, like me, myself, I'm not into, t I'm not, I don't do TTMs, you know, I don't really do consider myself like i don't really do pack breaks i break packs only because i want to collect sets but i get to see other people open packs that i could only really only dream about or you know it's just it's just not my thing but i love to watch you know other products man you know i get to see other people break products that i'll never see and get to see hits you know and a lot of these cards are you know the designs on them too nowadays is is is, is awesome you know, I'm used to just basic cards, and now these cards, you know, they, they just have some awesome designs. And then, you know, with the relic, the autographs, you know, I don't necessarily chase them myself, but I love to see other people that do when they break one open and they bust one or they get one in the mail. You know, I, I just love to see people happy when they get what they want. You know, that's that's one of the things I love about YouTube is you get to see sometimes people's expressions or hear how excited they are about something. Yeah, and I think that's a good point because there's also a great community on Instagram, a, a really big community on Instagram and Facebook as well. But for me, I, I will post on those social media channels and I'm involved in groups and I follow stuff. But I personally think YouTube is the best. It might not be the biggest of those, but I think it's the most intimate. I, I, I think it's I think you get to learn a lot more and um, I also think it certainly takes some guts to get out there. You're putting yourself out there more so um, on YouTube than you are on Instagram or Facebook, for that matter. I mean, Facebook, you can be connected. People can probably find, you know, they can find your personal page and stuff like that. But, I mean, for me, I've been doing YouTube videos for a few years now, and I'm really used to it. And I'm really comfortable putting my face out there, my thoughts, all that. And obviously, you... You know, you're not too shy either with uh, with your videos. You, you've done some pretty uh, pretty hilarious stuff, and maybe even some stuff that didn't last on YouTube all that long. But uh, I mean, do you agree with that in terms of the YouTube community? Uh, you can really get a sense for people. You can kind of feel like you get to know people um, a lot more so than the other social media networks. 
Oh, I, I would totally, completely agree with that. I mean, because I started off first, you know, collecting. Uh, when I first started collecting, I got back and I got into uh, social media. I was first on Facebook. And so I'm talking about 10 years ago. So I went to Instagram. And then on Instagram, you know, I found a lot. Of, and I was actually part of the, the small knit group. You know, there was like 10 or 12 of us. And, and so we agreed to only collect with each other because, I mean, I hate to say it, but there's also, a, a you know, there is a little bit of dark side into collecting with scammers and, you know, and stuff like that. And so on Instagram, and it's a lot easier if you to scam people. And that's why I prefer YouTube because YouTube where it's a lot more intimate, like you're saying, and you get to actually know the people you see them and you comment. There's a lot more commenting on each other in the tight group on on youtube and so as far as that goes i prefer youtube uh, over the other ones i still post you know on instagram and facebook <laughs> but one of the things about facebook is there's so many groups and i'm always worried about did i post this card on this group already you know did i post this card in this group already because there's so many and i and i you know maybe it doesn't matter but sometimes i don't want to post the same card you know in too many groups because so there's actually an inner we're intertwined to have you know there's a couple of facebook groups where it's the same people and it's like well this guy's already seen this card you know this guy's already seen this card and you know i'm just trying not to show the same card you know where everybody's oh, i've seen that card already well i've seen that card already so that's why i prefer youtube but the other ones you know they were a great start and and they're also great but yeah it could get overwhelming when you belong to like 20 facebook groups <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know facebook is in that it's in a, like a weird place right now where there are so many groups and uh, that you know you brought up like scammers and all that unfortunately in life you have to look out for that in kind of all facets mm -hmm. and that includes our hobby of sports card collecting i mean you have people scamming out on ebay and on these different areas so of course people want to be careful with who they deal with uh luckily i haven't had too many issues and i know you've been pretty lucky overall too but i want to move into uh, a little bit more about the sport of baseball before we get into uh a little bit more about your collection you uh you're a big baseball fan i would say correct yes big time big time and you've uh, had a lot of influences uh in baseball and that, of course, will lead leads into your collecting. But tell us a little bit about uh, some of the influences from your parents. I know your parents have both had some involvement playing, playing baseball, playing sports, and I would think that definitely played a role in you getting into baseball yourself. Uh, definitely. Uh, so ever since you know I can remember, uh, my dad was playing for an some kind of independently he was paid for El Paso Diablos and so we used to always get all kinds of gear and then we, you know we, we would go to his games uh you know it was a stadium and there's people there and and but then he got got hurt and then he just wasn't good enough just like you know happens to anybody else and he had to give up you know trying to become a professional and uh, but he always kept playing so even um, by the time I was five, six years old, we were going with them. Um, he, I remember, he would play like on Wednesdays, Saturdays, and Sundays. Um, you know, hardball, baseball, and so we would go to other games. And you know, me and my brother, I have a brother who's one year younger than me. We would always play catch. You know, we'd always, you know, during the games. Uh, that's one thing I gotta say about me is like I have a great arm. You know, if nobody knows, I have a, a arm. I could throw distance. I could throw from center field to home plate. You know, easily. And that's something that we would do. And I, w I would always compete with other kids. We would have a competition because sometimes there's like three fields in a row. And in the outfield, you know, if you play, if, when my dad would play on Wednesday nights, there's nobody at the park besides the people playing. And we would play a game where I throw the ball. And wherever you get the ball from, that's where you have to throw it from. So, and they would throw it back. And if they throw shorter, I keep moving up. I throw it farther than over their heads. They keep going back. And there was like a competition until the person went all the way back. And I used to love that game, and I got to the point where my arm was good. So, uh, you know, so my parents have always been a baseball family. My dad played professional, um, semi-professional, and then after that, he still kept playing. He still plays to this day, and he's like 50-something. Um, my I'm 60, <laughs> actually. And my mom still plays also. She plays uh, in a softball league, and she's a manager, of, uh, you know, of her team, and she plays two nights a week. And when I was a teenager, she actually got me a fake ID 
so I could participate in her in her team because it was at 18 and over. But obviously, she never gave me the ID. She just got it, you know, so she could enroll me on the team. So even when I was like 15, I was in any of those um, <laughs> any of any of those softball record books. So they have a little <laughs> asterisk and said we we had you know a 16 year old playing. Yeah. Uh, no, that, yeah, I think we got away scotch free. So my mom stayed out of prison <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, uh, baseball, I definitely have a love for baseball. I mean, in my garage, I have tons of bats, balls, gloves, and anytime anybody comes over, I love to play, you know, with all my nieces and nephews. I always try to, you know, play with them and improve their game. Cause you, you know, it's not just my immediate family. So even my uncles, my aunts, my cousins, my nephews, everybody, everybody in my family is just a baseball. You know, even my uncles that are still in Mexico, uh, which, you know, it's kind of a funny story. Like, I remember by the time I was a teenager and I went back and I and, and my uncles wanted me to play with them in their league. And these guys were all adults in their 20s, you know, and I'm over here for like a 14 year old. Oh, man, I was easily better than all of them because they, they, they just, um, you know, I remember the pitcher was probably throwing like 60 miles an hour, you know, this 20 year old. And oh, man, I was just ripping the ball and everybody was so impressed. But but then again, they didn't have uh, I remember like the bats that they had were so, you know, were so crappy. <laughs> and we had such an advantage in the United States over with the stuff that they were using over there. But I mean, even my family in Mexico, they are all into baseball. So I, you know, I don't know how that became about, but that's just the way it's been in my family. We're a baseball family. I love the game, and it's a great game. And you're also very fortunate that you get to uh, get a little closer to the game during the season. You uh, do some groundskeeping work with the Los Angeles Dodgers, your favorite team there. So that's got to be a, it's got to be a lot of work, but it's also got to be pretty neat. I I imagine you know last year walking out in an iconic stadium like Dodger Stadium and you're sitting there going, huh, it's a World Series and I'm I'm on the field. Like that that's just gotta be uh kind of a lot to take in maybe. You take a deep breath and then just get back to work. Uh it's definitely surreal, especially game seven, because as a fan, I was always a dream to be at a Dodgers World Series game seven even though in my dream it was always the Dodgers versus the Yankees you know and we beat them with the walk up home run but it didn't work out that way but you know two-thirds of the dream came true I was there you know at a Dodgers game seven world series and I was on the field you know I always used to say um once I found out you know gave up the dream that okay I'm not gonna be a professional baseball player um I always say one of these days I'm gonna make it to the show and the only other way to make it to the show was becoming a groundskeeper. And it worked out for me. So it's it's surreal. It's like a dream come true, to tell you the truth. And I love being a groundskeeper. I mean, not, not only being a groundskeeper, but I also got closer to the game. Uh, not, you know, because I love to watch um, infield. You know, before I used to love watching batting practice. You know, I wanted to see the long ball. You know, that's all I cared about. And once I became a groundskeeper, I got a lot more appreciation for fielding and studying the ball bouncing off the ground, you know, and stuff like that. And I can imagine how hard it was for people like Ozzy Smith in their days when they had to deal with bad hops, you know, all the time when they used to be a part of the game. Now the field conditions, man, they're so immaculate. It's so rare to see a, a you know, a bad hop. Yeah, unless you get like really – odd weather sort of like the world series back in 2008 i don't know if you remember that tampa and the phillies you had that crazy downpour where the game ended up getting suspended but there were like ridiculous puddles around that that was probably a nightmare for those guys but generally like you said especially out west out there in those california stadiums i mean you have perfect playing conditions and generally pretty perfect weather so but Obviously, you must do a pretty good job out there for uh, for the Dodgers and Dodger Stadium because the field looks looks spectacular. Yeah, it's pretty easy. It almost does it itself, you know, because uh, I am a you know in a we have a thing called the STMA where it's professional groundskeepers. So we do have conferences. We do all get together where it's all the NFL, the MLS, you know, the Major League Baseball, uh, where we all get together. And you got, and my, like my boss used to always say, my boss from Dodger Stadium, like when everybody asks him, he's like, what's your secret? He's like, it's LA, <laughs> the weather, man. You can't, you know, the grass takes care of itself, man, you know, and 
it's not too cold, it's not too hot, it, it's perfect. Uh, and that's always been my answer too, because uh, I do work at USC full time as a groundskeeper, and we get all these teams. I, uh, you know, we just played um, Villanova, and they were just all amazed by the field. You know, like, oh, we never played on anything like this. You know, because they're from Philadelphia, <laughs> and they were so amazed by. It. And they were like, "What's your secret?" I was like, "The weather, man. If you could get 80, 90 degrees year round, just it, it does it itself. I don't do anything but mow, fertilize. You know, the same things that." David Mellner tries to do in Boston. Yeah, they try to do in Chicago, but they got they got to deal with um, uh, the wrath of Mother Nature like we don't have to. Yeah, long winters, snowstorms have we having snow in April out here, so that's a little bit odd for us. But want to uh, start moving into talk a little bit about baseball cards and uh, obviously your family. You know, is was a big influence in your fandom of baseball, and you know, were they the uh, were they the biggest influence that got you started in collecting baseball cards? Well, I would have to say yes. Uh, well, my dad, we've always had baseball cards. I still remember having baseball cards. I, I used to have a baseball card of my dad, a team set from the El Paso Diablos. And and he used to buy his cards. And, you know, as far as I can remember, he never collected himself. But he used to buy his baseball cards when we were kids before we could even appreciate what they were. Uh, we had a giant toy box, and I just always remember that we used to have baseball cards at the bottom of the toy box. If you wanted to get the baseball cards out, you had to dig out all, you know, back then the Tonkas that were made out of metal. You know, I remember having a, a Millennium Falcon and an X-Wing fighter from Star Wars that were made out of metal. And so all those things were heavy to take them all out and then put them back in. But I've always had baseball cards. But the time that I did get into the spark me into collecting, like appreciate the hobby and actually – not just have cards, but put them together, know how to sort them, know what they mean, uh, was with my cousin uh, who lived in, um, lived in Echo Park right next to Dodger Stadium. And so when he would come visit us, we would always buy baseball cards from the ice cream truck. So, you know, I did buy uh, – the, I tried we, – we were buying packs, and he bought the last one that they had. And I, and I practically was crying, you know, and then the ice cream man was like telling me like, oh, no, you know, it's okay. You know, I got this if you want to buy it. And the thing was that the baseball cards were like 40 cents. So you could get the ice cream, for, the baseball card for 40 cents. And then you could buy like a big pop for, you know, ice cream for 50 cents and then still have 10 cents for a gum. And the guy wanted two bucks for that, that brass metal card. And I told him, I only have a dollar, and then I won't have anything. And he gave it to me for a dollar, which is, like, super cool. And then when my cousin saw it, he was two years older than me, and he knew who Mickey Mantle was. I had no idea who Mickey Mantle was at that time. Uh, so, you know, I got – and he wanted it. And it's just one of those things, you know, family and just, like, he wanted it so bad that I was like, oh, no, it's mine. It's mine now. <laughs> and and so I kept it for a long time. And it wasn't – because, man, I had to be, like, in, man, fourth or fifth grade when that happened. Um, Cause it was around 84. And so it wasn't until later when I started reading about baseball, I inherited, you know, this big box of baseball books and that I just, I read them on and I started learning about Mickey Mantle. And now, you know, once I read, came across the name Mickey Mantle and his story and I read it, I was like, yeah, hey, I think that's that little thing that I have. And I went back to my toy box and I pulled it out and that, that just sparked like, okay, this guy's my favorite player forever. And it's just the way it's been. You know, there's no other way explanation for it except for that moment when I just said, this guy is going to be my favorite player forever. And that's just the way it's been. And you're a Dodgers fan, but uh, you collect a lot of stuff. You collect Dodgers cards, of course, but you also collect some other stars from around baseball. I know Nolan Arenado's one, there's several others, but uh, Mickey Mantle is who you've told me is your main, your main PC, your main personal mm -hmm. collection. If you had to name one player, he, he's number one. And I guess it all roots back to that story. Yeah. If I had to give away all my cards, except for one player, uh, Mickey Mantle is one I'm keeping. And, you know, and as far as being say a Dodgers collector, I wouldn't even consider myself a Dodgers collector. I don't really ha – now I do have a Dodgers PC boxes. Before I didn't. You know, it wasn't until YouTube. You know, but before YouTube, okay, I would have to say I'm a bigger fan of baseball than the Dodgers. You know, I'm a baseball fan first. I love the game. I love every, all the teams. I love all the players. But you, who do you root for? You root for your home team. 
and my home team is the Dodgers. So obviously the Dodgers are my favorite team. If anybody wants to win the World Series, I want it to be my home team. But, you know, so I've always collected just sets. I've always collected just sets. But, you know, it's like I said, even the term PC was something that I just learned recently. You know, I didn't know uh, because when people tell me, what's your PC? Well, to me, all my cards are PC. I don't, uh, I'm not an investor. I'm not a dealer. I don't resell. Every card that I buy, I buy with the intention of keeping it with me forever. So really all my cards are PC, but because everybody else has a term PC and they want an answer, you know, so then I started breaking it down. Okay. Well, my favorite player of all time is Mickey Mantle and my favorite current players right now, stars, you know, are Renato Stanton, Harper, you know, and Bryant. So, I collect everybody and anything, you know, but yeah, you got to root for your home team and, you know, that's who I want to represent. Well, yeah, PC and personal collection can be, there are people who focus, they're very focused on their collecting and me personally, I'm kind of all over the place. I I collect a lot. I collect autographs and uh, I guess when I answer, I answer similar to you, I say the Phillies because I definitely focus on the Phillies. I collect more Phillies than I will. I'm not going to collect just random Houston Astros cards. That doesn't mean I won't buy Astros cards. I I like collecting different players from different eras and different teams, and that's all fine, whether they be autographs, rookies, whatever. But I guess a better word for you and I, the way we collect, because I think we both are similar in terms of collecting a wide variety of stuff, is more a focus. So you focus on Mickey Mantle and... I know you uh, You definitely collect Corey Seager because I know there's some YouTubers out there listening to this going, uh, he, he collects Corey Seager. He loves he loves Corey Seager, Corey Seager, Corey Seager. Yeah, a lot of people always ask, like, have you ever met him? I was like, well, yeah, I work at Dodger Stadium. I'm, uh, you know, part of my job is being in the dugout, you know, the, four, the, the fourth, fifth, and sixth inning. So, yeah, I've talked to him and people always say, hey, do you ever tell him about your channel? I was like, no, that would be embarrassing. <laughs> it's like we're co-workers. And if, and if he saw me going, you know, all girly and fandom over him, like it would be embarrassing to see him at work, <laughs> you know? No, but that is a serious thing. And I think people people who haven't been in that environment don't necessarily understand because I've over the years I did some work in the media. So I would go to the Phillies games and be in the press box and I'd be in the clubhouse getting quotes and stuff. And you have to separate yourself. It, it takes some discipline, but for me, it's not too hard. You just get in a different mind, state of mind. Um, but, you know, there's times where I'd sit there, especially back in the 07, 08, 09, when the Phillies were really good, when they were, uh, unfortunately for you, defeating the Dodgers a couple years in a row in the uh, <laughs> NLCS. But uh, they were some great teams, and I'd go in the clubhouse, and I'd be walking by all these guys, and I'd just be like... And I watch these guys on TV all the time, and I've grown up watching them. But you're in a different, you're in a professional environment, so you have to separate your fandom from what you do. So I, I, I can understand, you know, the way you have to go about that too. As much as you admire players and you root for them to win, and you know, you get a thrill out of seeing victory, and you collect their cards hobby wise, you can't. You can't just be like, hey, man, I collect your baseball cards, dude. Like, <laughs> you know, you have, yeah. to, you have to keep that part of it, you know, separate. Yeah, you do have to be a professional. And that's one of the main things I remember from my interview. Uh, like, my interview went well. I had plenty of experience. And I, was, and I was actually recommended to the Dodgers by Devin Meller, from the head groundskeeper from the Boston Red Sox, because – they had offered me an internship when I was in college. I had to write an, an essay uh, for a for a scholarship, and he was one of the judges. And so once he read my essay, he offered me an internship for Boston, which was in 2004, man. If I would have gone, I would have a ring right now. <laughs> uh, but that that didn't work out because actually at the time, you know, I already have a family, and the internship was only going to pay eight bucks an hour. And you had to, you know, supply your own housing, your food. And I was like, well, I can't afford to be in Boston and be um, paying for a place over there and supporting my family in California at the same time with that wage. So he was like, oh, he's that's too bad. But, you know, you really I really think you should uh, be a groundskeeper in the major leagues. And he referred me to uh, the Dodgers. And that's how I interviewed for the Dodgers for the seasonal job. 
And and when in in my interview after everything the interview was almost done, one of the last questions he asked me, he's all, "Are you a Dodger fan?" And I'm all, "Yeah," you know. He's all, "Well, that's what I don't want <laughs> because <laughs> the person before me got fired, you know, for being too big of a fan because you're not allowed to ask for autographs. You're really not supposed to talk to the players unless they talk to you first. You know, there are some rules of engagement, you know, if you want to call them that. But yeah, you know, you you can't just you know, be over there and like friends with the players, you know, you have, you, you're working for them. So. Yeah, of course. That's, and I, and I've had the press passes where, you know, it says no autographs, no, it gives you the whole spiel of stuff you can do and can't do. So, you know, as someone who collects autographs, it, it really wasn't that difficult. A lot of people would always ask me, they'd be like, well, don't you want to get not back? Well, I mean, I'd like to have their autograph, but this just isn't the time and the place. So that's fine. But, you know, it, it is pretty interesting when you're walking the hallways and, you know, you walk by and go, huh, that's Albert Pujols and stuff like that. You know, it, yeah. it's, it's definitely interesting. But back to the cards, um, you know, you kind of proclaimed yourself as an old school collector. And I guess for people out there wondering, like, what is an old school collector? And I, for me, I would say that would be being a set collector because there's still plenty of people who collect sets, but people don't put together sets the way they used to back in the old days or even the 80s and early 90s uh, also as you mentioned you're not really hit obsessed that doesn't mean you might not like them and you can discuss that but you know some people only are in this hobby for the hits for the thrill of the high high dollar card and uh also you're you're definitely someone who still prefers raw cards as opposed to encased slabbed graded cards and the trend in the hobby over recent years, especially lately, has been for the graded cards, slabbed cards, and all of that. So why don't you uh, talk a little bit about your mindset um, when it comes to collecting cards? Okay, well, when it comes to collecting, I, I do prefer my cards raw. I I like to smell them. I love the smell of baseball card cardboard. Uh, you know, and I can understand the younger generation. They probably never even felt a real cardboard baseball card. You know, it's probably not uncommon nowadays. But me, that was what I grew up with, um, the baseball card. Like, it was the same material as the shoe box we used to keep them in. And so the only thing there was to do back then was put sets together. I mean, you got, you know, um, we'd go and buy a bunch of 88 tops. And then you just have a bunch of them in, in a shoebox. And the only thing to do was put the set together. So I would keep buying more and more cars to complete the set. You know, and, and one of the funnest thing was that, okay, I got to say that growing up, I never knew. I never was close, at least. I never had a real friend that also collected baseball cards. I was kind of solo. My brother didn't collect cards either. Um, I really didn't have any friends that collected you know, so it wasn't until like I was in the majors in Little League when I started asking around, like, and then you meet other people. Oh, I have baseball cards, and you go to our house, and basically everybody always had a shoebox, you know, and you go through their shoebox and look for every card that you don't have. And it was easier back then too because there wasn't all these parallels. Or like even on one of my favorite sets today is the Top School label, and the Top School label. Every card has three variations of the same card, and I'm not trying to chase all three cards. I just want one card. I'm, you know, it's it's I'm simple. To me, if I get one card of each, I completed the set. But to a lot of modern people, it's like you have to complete the master set, or else and it's like, and that's fine if that's your thing. You can complete the master set, and kudos to you, and 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 um, I'll give you credit for that. I mean, you know, that's harder to do, but it's not my thing. I just like to collect basic. Um, and as far as encapsulated, you know, I, I actually think it's 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 a great idea. I mean, it preserves cards and stuff. But have you even seen any of my videos? Like, I have a 1955 Sandy Colfax rookie, and I lick it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and a lot of people are like, "What are you doing?" It's like, it's it's my card, you know. It's, and I'm not so much the investor, and and I do feel bad sometimes because I understand where people are coming from. It's like, well, you want to preserve that card for a future generation. And I guess I don't think too much, you know, ahead like that. I just feel like this is my card. I actually want to be buried with it. <laughs> you know, uh, my my kids don't collect, so I have no one to pass it down to. So I figure, by when I get older, I'm probably gonna. Now I think that I'm probably gonna sell them to other collectors, so they will be appreciated because something that 
other people have kind of talked me into like the cards you preserve the card take care of it you know it's not like if i'm throwing my cards against the wall or anything but i just i love to hold them in my hands you know and if you like to get them graded that you know that's awesome i understand that uh but me i just like to hold them feel the card you know it's hard to explain it's just something that it's just a habit that i have no there's a lot of people i think who um still like the raw cards and that's everyone likes what they like that's another great thing about this hobby and even the community of collectors is just such a such a diversity um all these different cards and you know one of the mindsets lately is definitely the hits a lot of people are in that mindset they open cards and they have to get the hits if they don't get the hits they're just disappointed and there's different products and different price points and stuff. And of course, if you're buying a product that's super premium, $300, well, you damn well want to get a really big hit because otherwise, well, how are you ever going to recoup any of that money or feel like you've gotten a value out of it? Uh, but I know, you know, just opening cards, you're usually opening stuff. If you're breaking a box of tops or uh, Heritage or whatever you decide to open, you're doing it to build that set. You can obviously buy sets. And sets can be bought at, you know, pretty reasonable rates. But there's something about building those sets, isn't there? Opening them, sorting them, and then co- kind of trying to complete that set. Yeah, it, it's definitely, uh, you know, and it might have something to do because there, uh, there was a video on YouTube. I remember one of the one of the first comments I made was somebody that had made a, a video and was talking about. You know, he had all his sets and boxes, and he was all like, why do we do this? You know, why do we collect these sets, and then we just put them away, but we don't want to get rid of them, but we don't look at them, you know, they just sit there. And, you know, I just respond, it's like, I think we're we're goal-oriented people, you know, and I have a goal to complete these sets, and that's why I'm doing it, you know. And once I, I complete that goal, it's like a trophy. That, that set is a trophy of, of something I completed, a goal that I had and I completed. And so I've always been a goaler and a person, I guess, you know, short-term goals. And my short-term goals are always just complete these sets. And then so I'm a baseball fan first. And sometimes people ask me, do you have football cards or basketball cards? And I have a few, but my goals first are to collect all the baseball cards. And then once those cards are complete, I have all the sets. You know, I'll dabble them more into some – and so some other sports, but my first focus is always baseball cards, but which is harder to do now. Cause when I was a kid, if I, I could complete the 1990 tops and then the Donruss and the Fleer and then buy some other sports. But right now there's, I mean, it, it's a, it's crazy because back then there was like three main ones, you know, tops, Fleer, Donruss, and then score. And then upper deck came in. But now even just tops alone has heritage go label and tops gold. And I mean, so, so many sets of top gypsy queen, top series one, two update tops, Chrome, yeah. tops Chrome update, and, uh, all the high end stuff. Yeah. They put out a lot of stuff, but, and now they're doing all the online stuff too, but it's just goal oriented, but also maybe hoarders to a degree too. <laughs> Yeah, I would have so to much say stuff. that. <laughs> they just if you don't if you can't up. throw away stuff, yeah, I guess you're a hoarder, right? <laughs> I mean, it's gotten to the point where I have a whole room full of baseball cards, you know. That's that's I think that's hoarding. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a lot of fun and um I I think it's cool to complete sets and save some in boxes and that and that's awesome. And some people collect the factory sets and they don't even ever open them. Uh but there's definitely something cool about completing a set and put, putting it in a binder so that it's there for display. So you can take it out and look at it and reminisce about it. Or if you do have someone who comes over who, you know, they might not even collect cards anymore, but they're into baseball and they, you know, they dabbled in cards. You can kind of pull it out and go through it and stuff. And I know you, uh, you have a lot of sets and binders and that's definitely, uh, that's a pretty cool thing to have as well. Yeah. And, and again, it's YouTube influenced. Uh, I mean, Okay, I've always collected sets. So I had all these sets and boxes. And, okay, some guy had a contest. Show um, your man cave and show us all your cards. And at the time, so I started making a video. And I was shooting around and showing all my cards. And then I said, oh, my God, I have such a mess. I'm not organized. So just to make that video, I started putting a lot of my sets in binders. And... 
and most of my sets, I still had the wax pack. You know, I always had one wax pack inside all my sets. So when I started putting them in binders, I would put the pack, you know, the, the packaging on, on the spine of the binder. Well, once I started trying to collect the 69 set and the 58 set and the 70, you know, five sets, like, whoa, I don't have any wax packs, you know, to label, to put on this. So I just started putting um, a common card on the outside. And people loved it, you know. And so that just kind of became my thing. And even now, my room, I have tons of binders. with, And even people who don't collect baseball cards, they just think it looks awesome. You know, so it, it kind of came by accident. It wasn't something I dreamed about or I'm not some kind of art decorator, but it just came about from being embarrassed from the way I had it. And then I started putting them in binders and putting the wax pack on the outside. And then I didn't have wax packs, so I just started using cards and everybody's like, oh, that looks cool. Why'd you come up with that idea? You know, it's like, hey, you know, I'm just cool. <laughs> and so now now that's how I do it. And everybody loves loves that. I get so many compliments on the way my wall of binders looks, you know. And that's how it came about, you know? Yeah, it's awesome. I have a stack of binders, but not many sets in binders. The only full set I have in binder is the 89 Tops, which I showed off recently. I, I am still working on my Phillies Ultimate Team set, and I'm getting close. Uh, I'm pretty close on that, but it's a lot of fun. Like, I can't wait to complete that, and I want to... Yeah. I'm looking forward to showing my dad it and have him go through, and then he can go through and see, like, the guys he grew up watching and then you know the more current players of course and then like i want to do the same thing with my brothers and i have a few friends that are huge they're not necessarily big sports card fans you know they might have a few cards from when they were growing up but like i want to go through and just see the reaction like i think it'll be funny to see the generations and that's one of the things i love personally about baseball cards is you know i love the history of the cards that's why i like the basic top set you know i love a lot of this other new stuff and I, I love the old school looking stuff like heritage, but like just seeing the history of how the card designs have evolved from that basic top set from the early fifties to now, you know, 2018. And then when you look at a specific team and you see how the players evolved and how the teams build up, I just, I think it's pretty cool. And, you know, I, I think it's one of those things um, each year, the set of cards, the team set or the full set, whatever you collect, you know, it, it's kind of like, it's just a piece of that team's, it's a piece of the sports history kind of cemented there on cardboard. And I, I, I think that's another aspect that is very cool. Well, definitely. Like, uh, I, I, I kind of, you know, I kind of stopped watching baseball after, you know, around 94, after the strike. And it's just me. I just wasn't a big fan of the steroid era. I know most people loved it. And me, I, w I wasn't such a big fan of it. And I kind of stopped you know, paying attention to the game. I only paid attention to the Dodgers, you know, and I kind of stopped collecting cards. And one of the cool things now that I, that I like about once I got back into the hobby, baseball cards are like little, little, you know, books of history. They're, they're, they're little history cards because now it's like, whoa, I never knew this guy played for that team. And then, you know, you're looking through all these old sets. Like, oh, I never knew he went to the Mariners. Oh, I never knew, you know, and like it, I would never would have known these things now if it wasn't for baseball because they're like little history books. You know, I found out all the teams that this guy played for. I, you know, uh, Will Clark, you know, when I stopped watching baseball, he was, you know, a Giants to me. And then when I got out of the hobby and I got back in and I started going through, you know, dollar boxes and they see Will Clark cards and I'm like, well, I don't know. He, he played. I thought he was a Giant. His whole, it was going to be yeah. a Giant forever. I forget he was but, a Texas Ranger and what, I think a Cardinal <laughs> for a year too. Right? Yeah. So uh, they're they, they're little history, man. Uh, even um, when I was, you know, my main heydays probably of collecting were like '86 through like you know '91, '92, and back then I knew every person's stats. I knew everybody, you know. I looked at the back of the baseball cards, or, you know, because if you're just collecting the '88 set, that's all you that's all you know, you know. And I would look through those cards daily on a daily basis, you know. Because that's all I had. You know, I had already completed my, you know, I'd never, the first set I completed was my 89. Okay. And it was the Steve Jeltz card, who was a Philly. And I remember when I finally pulled that card, I was so happy. That's why I mentioned Steve Jeltz. A lot of people don't know who the hell Steve Jeltz is. Oh, I know. Well, he, <laughs> he was the last card that I needed to complete the 89 top set. So when I got him, it was like, oh, and I remember that name forever now. 
Yeah. Uh, he, was, he wasn't exactly a very good player either. <laughs> no, I, I mentioned before in another video that the way, like, you know, um, I didn't know. I just knew I was missing card. I think it was like card 707. And I knew I was missing the card, but I didn't have any idea who it was. And it wasn't until I seen it was a, either one of those baseball card price guys. I don't know if it was Beckett. But they had a survey that they did with the baseball players. And it asked the pitchers. Who is the least feared hitter? You know, who would be the hitter you want to face? And, uh, you know, if you had to strike him out. And Steve Jeltz, you know, <laughs> won the vote. And that, and then I had a picture of his card. And I was like, oh, that's, and I found out that was the card I needed. So when I pulled that card out, as soon as I seen the Steve Jeltz, I knew that was the card I needed. And it was like, like nowadays, the equivalent of somebody pulling a hit. I was so happy, like, ah, oh, Steve Jeltz, yes, I needed this card so bad. You might you be know, the only and, person on earth who was ever excited to get a Steve Jeltz card, including his family. <laughs> uh, it, it probably was. Uh, but that's the beauty of collecting sets, man. The the most common card can bring you the same excitement as you know as some people have pulling a judge card. Yeah. Do you have a uh, have a favorite set? Uh, modern, the Top School label. I, I don't know what it is about it. I love the Top School label set. You know, uh, that's uh, out of all the things coming out now, I'm chasing the Top School label. Uh, as you can tell with the other cards, I, I could be collecting a set, and if somebody offers me, like, hey, I got these cards, you know, you want to trade, you want to buy them, sure, I'll buy them. But the Top School label, I have it on my head. I'm going to put it together from, from packs only. I'm not going to. You know, also one thing about me, if you want to say how old school am I, I've never bought online. I've never been on COMC. I've never been on eBay. And I've never been on, what is that, that Four Sharp Corners, all these names I hear. I don't. I, well, you I wouldn't like Four Sharp Corners because that's all just slab stuff. See, Beck, what is this? Why are they all in oh. prison? <laughs> yeah, you know, and I have kids, so I can't have four sharp corners. That's dangerous. You gotta, you gotta put tips on the, you gotta round off the tips. So I prefer vintage with rounded cards. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Topps Gold Label would uh, be my most favorite modern set right now. I like the Topps Gold Label. I like that they brought them back. I actually love the autographs. The framed autographs in that are just, they look awesome. Yeah. But, but the base cards, I just wish they were a little more like the Topps Gold Label in like 1998. That set's incredible. I don't know if yeah. you have any of the 98 gold label, but man, they're like a little yeah. thicker cardstock. They're so smooth looking. Yeah. And I think that's the uh, one thing we had to deal with and hope, you know, maybe people have to realize is we kind of control what's being produced, you know, and I think that's why there are so many more hits now. There's so many more autographs because it seemed like when I got back into the hobby 10 years ago, hits. You know, an autograph card or a relic only existed for star players. You know, like it seemed like I'm not really sure. I can't say for sure, but it seemed like back then, you know, if you pulled it, if I saw somebody pull a hit of an autograph or a relic, it was usually a star player. But now that the man is so high, like people want to get a hit, you know, every pack. So the only way a company can produce that is by sign, you know, getting common players to do that. And so I think that leads to a lot of disappointment nowadays when people, you know, because now any relic or any autograph is a hit. But to me, sometimes like, is that really a hit? You know, if you're pulling some guy you never heard of, yeah, you know, they definitely go heavy on the rookies because that obviously is, comes at a reduced cost. But that's what happens with everything. What about uh, vintage cards? What would be your favorite set? Um, it would probably be the 53 or the 56 tops, uh, the 56 tops. I, I fell in love with that, with the mantle card. It was a card that I was intrigued with. Cause I used to see that a lot on price guys was the 56 mantle because that was obviously the year that he won the triple crown. So I used to see that card a lot and there was something about, you know, the cash that he's making in the card. And so I fell in love with that set, but lately as of late, you know, there's change of hearts and you know for more experience uh because let's say i've always loved vintage cards but it wasn't until recently that i could say it now that i could afford vintage cards so now that i'm buying more and more vintage you know because it's just more accessible and more affordable for me now uh i'm kind of i love the 53 i love the 53 design uh 
so I would say the 53 is kind of on the top of my list. I mean, 52 would obviously be the most iconic, and if I could afford it, or you know, I would say the 52, but it's like an impossible dream, and I don't like to set goals that I can't uh, ever reach. Yeah, you, you know, it know. just leads to disappointment. Maybe, maybe things <laughs> so, yeah. go really right financially, and you're you like, know, have the hell with it. I'm, uh, I'm getting that Well, set. I've always... I've always figured that when I'm on my deathbed, I'm going to sell my house and buy a 52 top set. <laughs> <laughs> right? There's nothing to lose then. <laughs> uh, that's a pretty good plan. And and die happy. <laughs> yeah. Just holding a binder with a big <laughs> smile on your face. Look at this guy. Look how happy he was. Yeah. With all these tubes sticking out of him. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Um, yeah, we'll be wrapping things up here shortly. We've... Uh, We've had a nice little show, a nice little discussion, and I appreciate you joining. Uh, we discussed Mickey Mantle a little bit. How many, uh, how many Mickey Mantles do you uh, do you own in your collection? Man, you know what? I'm actually pretty close to owning every you know basic um, tops Mickey Mantle. Uh, I just purchased four because I'm not only trying to get every. Uh, base mickey mantle but i'm also trying to get every card you know that he's just pictured in and i'm pretty close i, I know i need the 53 bowman color where he's with bauer and yogi and there's a, just a couple more but that's the beauty of it is before these cards were impossible and sometimes i tell people i kind of thank psa i'm not too big of a psa guy you know and the way they, they do things but that's actually helped me out that's one of the great things i love psa is like Everybody wants the grade eight, nine, ten. And if I see a one, you know, that nobody else wants and the guy sells it for ten, I want it. I don't care about the grade. So I got to say that is like before as, as when I was a kid, you had two prices. You look at Beckett and you had, you know, good and, you know, just not so good. So the good card would be worth 50. And if you had a card that was beat up, it was worth 25. And now PSA has given you, you know, prices from, you know, a $500 card, it graded this is 400 graded that is 300 graded that is 200 and I'll buy the one that's worth 50 bucks. And so I don't think that would have been possible without PSA. We would have two prices probably still. Yeah, and it all depends on what you're looking for. I picked up a Mike Schmidt rookie uh, last week or so, and I didn't care if the corners were around it. I didn't want something crazy off center, but it was just for a binder for a Phillies team set. So I was like... Well, a PSA tens like thousands of dollars. I'll I'll take this one for like th- forty bucks or thirty bucks or whatever. I don't care. Yeah, as long as it still has exactly. good eye like, appeal. And in my perspective, and there are people that still you know go nuts on obviously the uh, the vintage cards in great condition and for good reason. They're pretty rare. They're you know they're seventy eighty year old cards. They're gonna be beat up. Um, but for me, it's all about the eye appeal, and I'm not as worried about the corners on the old stuff. I, centering bothers me the most, and obviously I'd rather not have one that's folded in half and stuff like that. But, you yeah. know, as long as I get a card that looks nice, if it looks like an antique, it looks like an antique because it is an antique. Uh, you know, yeah. I, I'm a little more picky on the brand new cards, you know. You're getting a card that's brand new. And, you want and, it in more pristine condition, but uh, that's well, a good point and, with the uh, – you know, the lower grades, lower prices, that can be an advantage. Yeah, it's an advantage for me, definitely. If I mean, if I could give one piece of advice, which I tell people a lot, and the people, and when I, and I get a lot of slack, uh, you know, kickback for this sometimes when I write it on Instagram, on Facebook, because people don't know or think it's a typo, but I like, I always like to say, act your wage. And what I'm saying, what I mean by act your wage, how much you make, you know, if, you're living in an apartment and, you know, and you can only afford a Mickey Mantle graded a 0.5. Be happy with that. Don't go out and buy a 0.5, you know, a graded five and be poor and be eating ramen noodles, you know, for two years. i not be able to pay rent. Act your wage in this hobby. It's very important to do. And so obviously, hey, man, if I just become a millionaire, hey, I'm going after all tens. Definitely. You know, I'm, I'll change. That would change. But for me right now, hey, I'm happy with anything I can get. And it's not a bad thing. You know, I'm happy that I got all these Mickey Mantles, man. Something that I thought was impossible, that it was an absolute dream. And it's almost like my dreams are coming true. And it's so fulfilling for me to just have any Mickey Mantles. And I got almost all of them now, which to me, a couple of years ago, it just seemed like I would never have a Mickey Mantle. You know, I remember my first Mickey Mantle I got was a 58 Tops and I got it on layaway. 
And when I first got that card, I said, I'm never going to get rid of this card ever, ever. I'm going to keep this card forever. My first making mano, I mean, I was sleeping with it and, you know, I had it under my pillow. I didn't care. <laughs> and, um, and then, you know, on, um, Instagram, when I'm one of the guys in my group told me that, Hey, me and my dad, I've been putting together that 58 set since I was a kid. And that's the last card that we need. And I was like, I really didn't want to give it to him, but I had to, you know, I had to. And so I ended up trading him that card. You know, I gave him the, my only 58 Mickey Mountain, which I said I would never, ever get rid of. But something else was born out of that because then a week later, he, you know, sent me a message. Hey, do you want to buy all my doubles that me and my dad accumulated for the 58 set? We have some doubles and some triples. And I said, well, how much? I was like, you know, how many cards do you have? And he's like, I have like 300. I was like, I can't afford 350. He's like, I'll give them to you for like a dollar each. And well, so that was my introduction to starter sets. I got that starter set of a 58, and now I'm, you know I need like six cards to complete it. So it, out of me trading my first Mickey Mantle came a good thing now. And so, hey, you never know how the, the, the world works, and it, it, I'm glad I did. You know, I made him and his dad happy, and he introduced me to a world of vintage that who knows how long it would have took me to realize that, hey, I could put together a 58 set. I could put together a 69 set. And one of the biggest things that I have is I, I don't really put a time lim limit on myself. My time limit is, is a lifetime. I have a lifetime to complete the 69. I have a lifetime to complete the 58. So I don't right away, if I see a card that I need, I don't go bonkers. Like, I have to have it now or I'm never going to get it again. This is my only chance. It will come around again, you know. So there's definitely uh, – that that was the, my upside to trading my 58 mano, my first card, and you know, and I got it again. And if you guys ever saw one of my first YouTube videos, I actually bought that 58 mano slab for less than the card that I had bought raw. So that's why I started discovering the advantages of PSA low grades because the 58 raw that I had was probably, you know, almost the same condition as the one that I bought graded like a two. And the one that I bought graded was cost way lower than the raw one that I had. So that's when I find out the advantages of, hey, I'll buy a, a graded one, you know, of, of whoever. And, hey, act your wage, like I said, and I'm happy. I'm very happy with what I got. Well, it sounds like you have a heck of a collection and enjoying the hobby. Baseball cards forever, essay. That's that's what you always oh, yeah, say. Oh yeah, definitely. And it's it's fun. It's it's definitely a fun hobby and I absolutely appreciate you joining the podcast today. It was a pleasure talking to you. And uh any uh any final words for our uh, listeners out there on SoundCloud and iTunes and YouTube and everyone who joined. We we definitely appreciate you guys listening. Uh, well, with me, it's just uh, something that one of my slogans is love the hobby, man. Uh, love the hobby and the hobby can sometimes love you back. <laughs> it can. And it, uh, and it is about community. and it is about having fun with this hobby. Like you discussed, there's different type of people out there, the collector involved in the hobby. And obviously, I always tell people, obviously, you want to collect something that has value. You don't want to spend uh, your hard earned money and your time and, you know, put a lot of effort into collecting junk you don't want to collect something that no one has interest in. But the most important thing is to enjoy the hobby, enjoy collecting. And, you know, there's a lot of relationships that come out of that as well. And that's something that's big with the YouTube community. So it's, it's definitely a good and fun hobby to be involved in. Oh, well, definitely. Uh, like I said, I don't know any, I don't really have anybody that I can go to their house right now and trade with in person or, you know, but I have all these friends on YouTube, man. And it really is, uh, you know, we call it the card community. And some, you know, there's even a, another group that we call the card family. And it really is. And it's it's great to be a part of it because we all share the same the same interest and the same hobby. And this, it's a great hobby, man. I love the hobby. Absolutely. All right, Caesar. Appreciate you joining me today. Again, everyone out there, you can check out Caesar's channel on YouTube. His name is Pepino Man. So you can follow that <laughs> channel and you will learn, you'll learn about the hobby and you'll see some great cards, but you'll also be thoroughly entertained for sure. No doubt about that as well. So Caesar, have a, have a great one. And thank you so much for joining me. Hey, thanks for having me, man. This was great. This was a great talk. Thanks. It was a lot of fun. All right, everybody. Thank you for listening to hobby talk. 
talk to you next time. Ciao!